be posted on the commission. And the recording will be posted on the commission's webpage shortly after the meeting. TBW may also be streaming this live and archiving it for additional viewing opportunities. For everyone's reference, today's agenda can be found under the first tab in the materials. And as a reminder, again, if you're not a member of the commission, please turn off your camera. Vicki Lowe, Chair of the Universal Healthcare Commission, will now call the meeting to order. Thank you, Mandy. It's now 2.03 and I call the October 13th meeting of the Universal Healthcare Commission to order. We will begin by doing a land acknowledgement. Um, and unless there's someone else who wants to do a land acknowledgement, get a little practice, I will do it. Um, today, I am not at my home. I am in, um, in the ancestral lands of the um, Puget Sound, Salish, Nahomish, Tawana, Skokomish, and present day Tulalip tribes. And as we gather today, we need to acknowledge that we are all on the ancestral homelands of indigenous people who have lived here since time immemorial, their enduring care and protection of these lands and waters and their preservation of traditional knowledge enrich our lives every day. Please join me in expressing our deepest respect and gratitude. Okay. Um, Let's see. So we'll start with the overview of the agenda. And on the screen. Um, so we'll do welcome and call the order as uh, which we already did. Manny's going to do roll call. And our question for this month is what is your favorite part of fall? So as we do roll call um, and you say that you're here, um, maybe let us know what is your favorite part of fall. And then after um, roll call, we'll do the meeting summary from the August 16th meeting. And then we'll hear public comments. After public comments, the health management associates will present an overview view of the year and discuss our planning for the next year. And I encourage commission members to um, questions, ask questions, then give feedback to help um, facilitate our discussion. And if I don't hear from you, I might call on you. So be prepared. <laughs> um, and then I just want to thank you all for your time and effort. I know it's been a big push reviewing all the parts of the, um, the report and um, there was so much good input and um, I hope you're happy with what we see, but just a reminder that it's our first report to the legislature. And so um, now that we're getting that out of the way, we'll take a vote on it. Um, we can move forward and really get into the meat of why we're really here. Um, not that there's a problem with reporting to the legislature. So um, I just, We'll turn it back over to Mandy for the roll call and just remember to talk about what is your favorite part of fall. And I guess I'll have to think real quick. <laughs> Good afternoon, commission members. I will call on members by their first name in the order listed in the agenda, which is alphabetical order by first name. When I call on you, please unmute your microphone and let us know that you're here. What is your favorite part of fall? And then please mute your microphone again. Chair Vicki. Uh, present. Um, and my favorite part of fall is Halloween because um, my grandkids just really love Halloween and dressing up the same as my my um, own children did. So it's like a big holiday in our family. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Ann? Senator Ann? Fidisha? I'm present and um, I guess I love everything about fall, the weather and yes, Halloween with all the candies that comes with it. So it's always good. Thank you. Dave? I'm here this afternoon. Um, wasn't sure I would make it, but I'm glad to be here. Um, my favorite part of fall and I promise I'm not just promoting Washington agriculture. I love apple cider. So go Washington with our apples and apple warm apple cider. Thank you, Dave. Senator Emily? Present. Um, I'd say my favorite part of fall is a pivot to cozy food. You know, soup season, and I just started prepping to make my first batch of tamales for the year. I'm excited about cozy fall food. 
Yum. Thank you, Senator Emily. Estelle? Present. Hello. Uh, I will say, going a little bit off script here, but I feel like this is the first time I've actually been able to make roll call because usually my life is so crazy running around. So I appreciate maybe this fall slowdown that has allowed me <laughs> the bandwidth to actually make it to the very beginning um, present. And besides that, I love the fall colors. Um, it just, those transitions, the uh, reminder of the cycle of life and how, you know, as things die, we get to welcome a new rebirth in the following year. But I, I love those fall transitions and colors. Thank you. Jane? Good afternoon, everyone. And I apologize for being off camera because I'm going to be off camera until I finish eating my lunch. But um, my favorite fall activity, early fall, is hiking and munching up the eating huckleberries as I am hiking up the trail. I realize I'm eating the bear's food, but hopefully there are enough huckleberries for the bears as well. Thank you, Jane. Joan? Joan? Representative Joe? Uh, here. Uh, favorite things about fall, I like the cool, crisp evenings and mornings, and nothing's better than a fresh apple off the tree. Thank you, Representative Joe. Karen? Karen? And Dr. J did let me know that she might not be able to attend. Kristen? Kristen? Representative Marcus? Present. Uh, I think my favorite thing about the fall is the renewed interest in permanent daylight saving time so we can hashtag ditch the switch and lock the <laughs> clock and never fall back again. Thank you. Mohammed? Mohammed? Mohammed did let me know that he might not be able to attend as well. Nicole? Present. Oh gosh, favorite thing about fall. So I have this giant tulip tree in our backyard and it's beautiful when the, when the leaves change color. However, uh, my son just recently uh, nicknamed it Big Dumper after Cal Rally from the Mariners. So uh, it is known to drop quite a bit of leaves and we're expecting that and also go M's. <laughs> Thank you. And Stella? Stella? I actually believe that <clears throat> still is on. Oh, I, we can hear you. Oh, okay, good. It's working then. <laughs> Present. <laughs> I'm glad to be back. Uh, my favorite part of fall is uh, I live in the Yakima Valley, so the harvest coming to an end. And uh, I'm a salsa maker, so I always prepare peppers for the winter and just finished doing 40 pounds yesterday. That is very impressive. Thank you, Stella. And thank you, everyone. I will turn it back over to Commission Chair Vicki Lowe, who will facilitate review of the meeting summary and public comments. And we should get a Stella and Senator Emily together and have some tomatoes <laughs> and salsa. <laughs> um, thank you, and thanks for participating. I know it's a little awkward, but you know, with us not being in person, it's the only ways we have to get to know each other a little bit. So. Um, so please join me in turning to the second tab of your um, commission book. The recording of the um, last meeting is posted on the web page. Um, we're going to use the consensus process for voting on approval of the last meeting sum uh, summary like we always do. So are there any discussion on the meeting summary? Is there any um, proposed changes?
Okay, if there aren't any proposed changes, then I propose the minutes are accepted without any change. Is there any discussion on that proposal? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The meeting summary is approved by consensus. So now we'll go to tab three and the public comments received since our last meeting are found under this tab. And then we will open up the floor for any public comments. And we allow individuals to sign up um, to provide public comments before the meeting. And we will start with those who have signed up to provide comments. If you have not signed up, and would like to um, provide public comments, please raise your hand. Then Mandy will call on you after we hear from those who signed up. When you are called upon, please state your name and affiliation, if any, before speaking. Um, and if, if you are able to raise your hand in, if you are unable to raise your hand in Zoom, sorry, we'll provide an opportunity for additional comments at the end. Um, so please do not, Play, raise your hand more than once. We like to keep people in line and it helps um, ensure everybody has a chance to speak and that we can find you. So um, you're welcome to provide written comments as well. Sometimes those are helpful because it looks like we have a minute and 30 for comments today. Um, so if you feel like you can't get it all in, please follow up with some written comments. Um, and so 90 seconds or a minute and 30 seconds is um, our time for today to make sure that everyone who signed up gets an opportunity to speak. The timer is already displayed. Um, and so Mandy, will you please start with the names and um, we'll hear comments. Thank you. Thank you, Vicki. I have Catherine Lewandowski. Um, yes, hello members of the Universal Healthcare Commission, and thank you for letting me testify today. Um, again, I want to thank all of you for your dedicated service to this commission, and I know that you've already heard from many of us from several organizations about why we are in support of quickly establishing a universal healthcare plan that covers all Was residents of Washington. Um, regularly, people must, by necessity, purchase products and services that afford the most value for their money. That product is obviously a plan that resembles option A. And we continue to encourage you to go forward with implementing a plan such as option A. But I want to touch on something that was mentioned over the summer, I believe by Representative Schmidt. I believe that it is an important consideration and I don't want it to be ignored or overlooked. Representative Schmidt expressed that there would not be support for many in his caucus if we were to be looking at a system that might attempt to cover undocumented residents of Washington. I know that in whole Washington's current I-1471, as in our previous I-1362 and I-1600 initiatives, all re residents of Washington are covered regardless of citizenship. Here are the reasons why myself and others in whole Washington feel this is necessary, a necessary component of our universal healthcare system. Covering all residents helps to improve the overall health of our communities. Covering all residents improves the individual health of people in our community. And covering all residents reduces overall costs to our system. And so it's fiscally conservative. And I think I'm out of time. So I'll follow up with the rest in writing. Thank you. Consuelo Echevera. Consuelo? Chris Curry? I'm going to move on to Chris Curry. And Consuelo, if you happen to attend later, we can circle back around to you. Chris Curry. I will move on to Marcia Stedman. 
uh, present. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> and thank you um, for this opportunity to speak to you today. I'm Marcia Stedman. I'm a board member of Healthcare for All Washington. And I, we encourage the commission to honor the vision of the Universal Healthcare Work Group that recommended this creation of this body in the first place. As detailed on page 269 of this meeting's materials, they envisioned that the commission would include an action-oriented, focused group of state leaders, a targeted work groups to define specific areas, stakeholder input at multiple points in the process, in short, something like the 1993 Healthcare Commission, which requires staffing and resources. This means more meetings are needed, not fewer, means creating subcommittees of the FTAC to make it effective, and encouraging robust interaction between the commissioners and their advisory committees. And of course, securing more staff and more funding to support this necessary work. We advocates are ready to do the lobbying needed to secure this funding. Significant time and dollars could be saved by leveraging the previous work of the Universal Healthcare Work Group and learning from the frameworks and roadmaps provided by our own Washington Health Security Trust Bill the whole Washington Health Trust Bill, and Oregon's Task Force on Universal Healthcare, the report of which was just released, and other state efforts. So thank you for um, this opportunity, and I look forward to seeing how the future year works out. Thank you. Thank you. Green Greenland. Thank you. Um, my name is Maureen Brinkland, and um, I'm the voting member for North Seattle Progressives uh, with the Coalition Healthcare as a Human Right. Um, I want to thank you for making time for these public comments at the beginning of the meetings. It's very helpful. Looking briefly at today's materials, I noticed the enormous list of FTAC responsibilities and tasks. I also noticed that in a small group of people with a giant list of tasks, the only, they only meet every other month. And there's only one member that's designated as a consumer rep. As one of the several millions of consumers, which is not my favorite word for who I am, <laughs> let's say patient, because that if I use the medical services, I, that's who I would be, who will be served by this system, I'm concerned that the views of many experienced patients end users of this system will serve that that the system is intended to serve are not being given a much larger role in participating in the design and decisions being made. It seems unrealistic to think that one person in addition to all the requirements needed to serve on the FTAC, the way it's now described, can hope to represent the needs of the many diverse communities and people in our state. I live in Seattle, but I know that all across Washington State, there are fellow residents whose situations relative to healthcare are very different from mine. Building an equitable patient-centered system requires including and listening to all interested party, especially those who have been poorly served by the existing system. Their input needs to be included at every phase. Without this inclusion, a patient-centered system will be difficult to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kelly Powers. Hi there, I'm Kelly Powers and I'm with Healthcare for All Washington. And I thank you all for your work and for this report. And uh, I want to let you know that we strongly support the idea of a two track approach that you're gonna talk about later uh, in the meeting. One track for immediate solutions and the other to design a universal healthcare system. We think this is a really great idea for managing the commission's work. So we applaud that effort. I wanted to second Marcia's comments. We're very concerned about the FTAC, the scope of the work and the frequency of the meetings. Another state tackled these same issues and broke it down into five smaller focused groups. It had five staff members and over a two period, period of two years, they met over 250 hours to come up with a blueprint for their state's universal healthcare system. We did the math and at the proposed rate of meeting two hours per month, it would take the Washington Commission 10 years, 2033, to complete the same amount of work. 
We recommend that the commission go back to the drawing board and redesign the FTAC to use smaller focus groups that can meet concurrently and more frequently with adequate staffing to deliver impactful results in a timely manner. And as Marcia said, we're willing to lobby our legislators for increased staffing, much as we did to create the work group itself and the commission. Thanks for all you do. Thank you. I'm looking now to see if anybody has their hands raised. I will at the end circle the back around to those individuals who are listed but have not yet um, not answered when their name was called. I see Consuelo. Oh, great. Consuelo, are you able to provide public comment? Yes, I am. Can you hear, hear me? I'm sorry I was late. I had some technical difficulties. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to just keep this really brief as everybody has covered many other things. Um, I would actually just like to really speak to the consultants, if I may. And I'm a little bit perplexed as to why the consultants aren't reflecting the remarks, not of the citizens like us, but of the actual commission members. In the final draft report that, that was given to us, governance is still the third thing on the list. And yet everyone from Aaron Katz to Joan to Nicole to Vicki herself and Representative Schmick have all brought up the fact that governance needs to be first and foremost. And in this, I'd really like to call out Representative Schmick uh, because he has many times repeated this as well as the fact that it is essential to do this because we have to build trust in the, in, in the community for this. And yet none of this seems to be reflected in the final report. That's all I got to say. Thank you so much for all of your work. Thank you. I see Margaret Decker has her hand raised. Marguerite? Perhaps that's an accident. Chris Curry, just one more time. Uh, did you call me, Marguerite Decker? I, I did. Okay, sorry, I stepped off just, just a second. I'm Marguerite Decker and um, I'm happy to speak. Uh, I am a representative of North Seattle Progressives. And my main message is uh, simple, just that I have a sense of urgency regarding this topic. I would like to see the commission uh, get bolder than it's been um, and assert for more funds for staffing more meetings and just get this ball rolling because this is a critical life and death issue for um, everyone really to have health care without having um, the prospect of our Medicare and our tax dollars being siphoned off by uh, insurance companies. So please get bold, be brave, and do this good work. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try Chris Curry one more time, but I don't see him attending in the attendance list. And I think that's all the hands that I have raised, but just in case, is there anybody out there who would like to provide public comments that is unable to raise their hand or whom I missed? And I see Sarah Weinberg. Uh, thank you, commissioners. Um, <clears throat> I'm a retired pediatrician who has been involved in advocacy for a national universal health coverage system since the 1980s. Um, that's a long time ago and we're um, essentially still on square one. I wanna offer one thought for you guys. The United States has chosen the wrong model for healthcare. They are treating, we are treating healthcare as a business and therefore we are dealing with profiteers and other um, consequences of trying to raise money and lower costs rather than the public service model of healthcare that the rest of the developed world uses. 
that views it as a responsibility of the government to provide adequate funds for the healthcare system to function, to take care of the needs of patients and of the health professionals who are providing the care to those patients. It's just a stepping back to rethink the whole thing. And that's what option A does for our state. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I do show that Chris Curry is now attending. Uh, Chris, would you like to provide a public comment? Chris, are you having technical issues? Because I see you're not muted. Is there anybody else who'd like to provide public comments in the meantime? I have my hand up. Great, thank you. Mr. Katz? Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Aaron Katz. I'm a, a mostly retired uh, faculty person from the University of Washington School of Public Health. Um, just one comment. Um, I think you received this uh, in written form, but um, it seems, you know, now that you're at the end of your first year and um, you're putting together this report to the legislature that this is um, an important uh, point to, to really focus on developing a shared vision um, of what the commission wants to be doing. Um, and I just, uh, I, I bring that to you after, you know, having, I was the main policy um, staff person for the Washington Healthcare Commission that worked between 1990 and 1992 that led to the Washington Health Services Act. And we actually spent, I mean, you may not have the luxury of this, but we actually spent the first year um, developing a common understanding and vision for our work. And it helps to really bind uh, the commissioners together in, a, in sort of a common uh, direction. So I would really urge you to make this a, a high priority on your work plan for, uh, for the next year. Thanks. Thank you. Chris Curry, were you, are you, were you able to resolve your audio issues? Okay, I will turn it back over to you, Vicki. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you everyone for your public comments. They are really important to us. And I'm gonna turn it over um, to the consultants from Health Management Associates. We wanna welcome back Liz Arjun, Gary Cohen, and is John not here? John is not here today. Okay. Sorry about that. So just listen, Carrie, and they'll help facilitate us um, the review of our work and then um, moving forward to what we're going to do in the next year. So thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Vicki, and good to be with all of you today. Um, just a quick, um, you know, letting you know what we're going to be covering today. Um, we're going to be talking uh about a little bit about how what we've gone through, what you all have gone through over the last seven months to pull this report together and hopefully move to adoption. Um, we're then gonna talk about the work ahead in 2023. Um, we have some preliminary thoughts, um, but really wanna engage all of you on what that should look like. And then finally, um, spend some time talking about the FTAC charter. Um, we've talked about that uh, that technical advisory committee uh, a couple of times in the past. And we said, we bring a charter here for review and discussion. And so we wanna um, spend, spend our time on that. So with that, I'm just gonna move through a little bit of background on the report. Um, we're not gonna really go into a lot of the details on the report. Um, that um, the process to get there um, has been going on for seven months, but I do want to remind everyone, um, if you can go to the next slide, Angela, that would be great, um, that there really were um, 
you know, a few requirements that were articulated in the legislation. And the last seven months have really been designed around trying to meet those requirements. A lot of it is about setting up the process that you're going to be undertaking over the next few years or you know, in perpetuity because this is permanent commission, but setting up the way that um, you want things to work um, to, to do this design work. And um, another, so that's the first requirement was the strategy for the, the design of this universal system. Second requirement is uh, the, a recommendation for implementing uh, reimbursement rates for Apple Health. Um, and finally, um, recommendations for coverage expansions, excuse me, to be implemented um, prior to the adoption of the universal healthcare system. So the transitional solutions. Another recommendation that is not on this slide, but we're going to talk about a little bit later, is the requirement to establish a finance committee, and that's the FTAC. So really, this last seven months has been uh, focused on trying to meet this requirement. Um, I know for many of you and for many members of the public, we're all really wanting to dive into the details and the work and the design, but um, because of the requirement, uh, we had to really uh, spend our time doing that. So that is what we're uh, we're moving towards today so that we can get to the fun part. So if you could go to the next slide, Angela, that would be great. So just to, start, just to recap the way that we've done this, um, over the last seven months, we have broken the report up into the sections that were articulated in the legislation. And we've been sending drafts to all of you, discussing them in meetings, getting your revisions, hearing from the public, and making those revisions in a um, sort of um, cascading process um, uh, to, to describe that. Um, and so now what you have had over the last week is really, or the last week since uh, Mandy has sent it out, was the combination of all that. Um, and so um, hopefully uh, you have seen your comments addressed. Um, I know that I had some, some uh, interchange with inter interaction with some of the commissioners. And so we, you know, hopefully those all got addressed in the draft that you have seen, the final draft that you've seen over the last week. But again, just to, to just get back to this point is that this report really is not about any significant policy decisions. It really is about the process and how you're going to be moving forward. Um, and so, I, and I think, um, you know, we have gone over um, some of the, you know, foundational elements that are, are already in place here in the state and some of the work that's been done, the Universal Healthcare Work Group um, that, that um, met and uh, led to the creation of this permanent commission. We spent time talking about the core components of a universal system and then Washington's readiness to implement those. And then based on all that, we uh, developed a preliminary strategy that we talked about with all of you. Um, we also, um, something very unique to Washington's uh, commission is the charge to look at short-term solutions. I, my understanding is that the other states that are looking at universal healthcare systems, um, Oregon um, in the past Vermont, they, they have been focused on that, um, that big long-term goal, but Washington's commission is unique in that it gives you the permission and the authority um, and direction to really be looking at what are some of the things we can do in the meantime to fill in the coverage gaps and begin to address that. So we spent some time on that. Um, we talked about the, uh, finally, we talked about the um, reimbursement rates, a piece of the legislation asking that we increase Medicaid rates. And finally, the finance committee. So that's really how we've gotten there. And so today we're here to um, move that report forward um, for approval so that we can get to the fun part. So I'm going to turn it over to Vicki for that. Chair Vicki. All right. Um, <clears throat> I'll uh, take a motion to adopt the final report for submission to the legislature. So moved. Thank you, Jane. Is there a second? Do we need a second? I'm sorry. I also do city council, so. <laughs> second. <laughs> okay, thank you, just in case. Um, so is there any discussion on the approval? Any discussion on the approval? Oh, Representative Schmick. Thank you. Um, I can appreciate the description of process 
that we've gone through to get to this point. But I, I still am, I've just made a list of several of the things as I've been reviewing the, I even went back to the work group uh, and their recommendations, uh, basing my questions on there. And I have a few, who's in, who's out. I mean, we haven't talked about that uh, much at all, uh, frankly. These are just basic questions though, that I think need discussion. And, and we haven't, uh, some of the assumptions uh, made on there is that the, the option A wants the state to perform the function that uh, insurance companies do now. Um, we really don't have a good idea of the costs of doing that. We have ideas, but we're replacing the system and we're going to ask the state to do that. We really don't know. Um, we've not talked about expectations. Who's in charge? of what's gonna be covered and what is not. And the openness of that, uh, because uh, I think that if people believe that anything and everything is gonna be available, I, I just don't see that happening. And the, to me, these are, these are basic ideas that haven't we haven't even started to discuss and I imagine in the future we're going to do that and of the uninsured population I was looking at the OIC report and there's really not I'd sure like to know why these people of the percentages that are not insured like to know why and if they're not insured with the options that are currently available in our state and the things that they could do to get insurance, uh, are they going to participate in this in the future? And so uh, I, I struggle with what the report that we're sending today, and those are some of my concerns. Um, and uh, I have more, but I'm gonna stop there. Uh, I. I, I would have liked to have gotten to a little bit more meat on the bone uh, on this. And so that those are my thoughts. Thank you, uh, Chair, for allowing me to uh, discuss these. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other comments? Do we have, wanna have a little discussion about that? Because um, I know the the focus has been on the report and moving it fast and and I know that's kind of hard. Um, Nicole, well, I guess I would just say that um, you know looking back at uh, five three nine nine uh, as passed um, that here under section two it talks about or subsection section two uh, one it talks about. Uh, this being something that's available, uh, provides coverage and access for all Washington residents. And so um, I think that's kind of the framework in which I'm operating under. Um, I don't know if anybody else has read it differently, but uh, that's what it says. Representative Schmick. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and I think that, uh, uh, I think the Medicaid program and reimbursement rates absolutely need to be looked at. If that is the determination, if that's the reason why people aren't getting coverage and then the equity in coverage or equality in coverage is not being equal, then yes, absolutely, we need to take a look at that. But that is an option that we can do now, not necessarily moving down this pathway for universal care. Um, and I, so that's, that would be my response. And those, those two items are in, are the recommendations in the report. Um, any other comments? Okay, well, we'll do a consensus. I, I feel bad, Representative Schmick, I don't know what else to say. I mean, I think- Can I, can you I have pop valid... in here really quick, yeah, Ricky? I um, absolutely hear your comments, and um, I think we are actually going to be talking about all of those topics that you mentioned as we develop the work plan for next year, because those are the very issues the next 
year is going to be focused on who's in, who's out, and over a series of meetings, perhaps um, bringing that data forward and looking at it and digging in and seeing how the FTAC can potentially help you. So um, it is, I, it is, I, I think for everyone, it's, it is um, because of the legislative requirement, it is a bit of a frustrating uh, report. It's not giving you everything you want at this point. It's really just about setting up the process, but we're hopeful that um, we can design next year to be all about these kinds of discussions and decisions and establishing common vision, things like that. So great comments for later. Yeah, yeah, and we'll talk about the, uh, I think there's public comments about how doing two things at once, um, kind of moving the short term and looking at the long term and you know, we'll see where we end up. So thank you. Does that help Representative Schmick? Well, you have to realize I spent two years on the other work group mm -hmm. and then in, <laughs> yeah. and now this has been a year or however long we've been on this one. Mm -hmm. It's it. Sometimes it's perpetual meetings. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So um, we have been using the consensus voting, so we'll do that um, again. So we have a motion on the table to adopt the final report for submission to the legislature. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? I'm going to vote my as, uh, as being opposed for okay. reasons that I've stated. Thank you. Thank you. We all appreciate that. Thank you. All right, the motion carries. Right, so, so back to you, Liz, sorry. Right. No, no, it's okay. Thank you, Representative Schmick, for, for kicking us off actually on this discussion. So um, we've had some preliminary conversations about work plan um, based on the, com the conversations that we've had, that you all have had as a commission and the responsibilities that are outlined in the legislation. and. I um you know we uh, HCA and HMA have put together uh, you know some of the givens in our next couple of slides um, based on those conversations and really with the with the goal to get your feedback on how we would lay it out over the next year. Um, but I want to share some of our thoughts and ask some questions and then really facilitate a conversation so we can um, we can put this work plan together for next year and get going. So again, um, as you know, just to remind everyone, and it was some of the folks in the public comment laid out, um, we have two tasks from um, the legislature, really, it's designing the new system, but it's also purport, proposing short term solutions that can move us in that direction, whatever those may be. There are so many um, initiatives already underway in this state um, that could, you know, perhaps be built from, strengthened, learned from. Um, so we just want to make sure that we keep that talk in mind. Uh, top of mind. So given that, do we do do folks like the idea of having the commission meetings really designed to have a two track focus? So like one part of the meeting is focused on short term solutions. And then another part of the meeting is focused on designing the new system with the input um, as directed um, by all of you with the input and support of the FTAC. So Jane. So that makes a lot of sense to me, but the one thing I will say is, and Representative Schmick and Representative Vercelli and Senator Randall know this really well, Washington State often meets our goals by taking incremental steps and incremental policy. So my only thought on this one is, I think rather than calling it necessarily two track, we could call it iterative on the assumption that hopefully the short-term solutions that we would work on mm -hmm. would all feed into what we would want the universal or the new system to reflect so that we're not doing things that are fundamentally inconsistent with where we want to go overall. So just a thought on how we sort of think about it and structure it. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think um, it, in terms of, it's just really interesting to think about how you would 
you could structure a meeting or talk about a specific policy or a long-term goal and then kind of then look at like what's in place and what could you build from to you know to start furthering in that direction so that's a that's a really interesting way to think about it Jane and thank you for reminding us of that other thoughts on this ways to structure it to make sure that we're doing that And I guess without the other option is having meetings just focused on one or the other, I guess is what we're asking is the option as the other option. Yeah, I think, I think the idea is, do we make sure that every single meeting we're spending time, you know, considering a design element, but also thinking about what can we do in the short term? Or it could not, it could be something totally different. That yeah. This is for commission members to decide. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is just uh, a thought given the task from the legislature, how we could talk about it in, in two different ways. So um, it's really up to commission members. Um, this was just a, a thought proposal. Nicole? Uh, yeah, uh, I was gonna say I actually like the two tracks or, or the iterative type system. Uh, it would allow us to still make recommendations and given that it's a permanent commission, um, you know, we will need to make recommendations throughout and um, based on legislation that gets passed each year, I mean, it, it makes sense as things morph and change within our healthcare system as a state and potentially as a nation. Thank you. Any other thoughts? I'm looking, she hasn't talked yet. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Jim. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Yeah. Are, you talking, to, are you talking to me, Vicki, or were you talking to Joan or something? I'm just looking to see who hasn't talked yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, you know, just warning people. <laughs> so does that sound okay to do, or maybe like the first couple meetings we focus on, um, the long term, and then I'm thinking of Representative Schmick's comments earlier. Just wanting to know where we're going, right? Um, if we do well, a little and more. there there was a comment um, during public comment about establishing a vision and a common understanding. Um, How do people feel about doing like a? a few meetings really focused on that because we already have some legislative recommendations from the report and then the legislator is going to be meet the you guys are going to be meeting and we focus on the um vision and then you know once we have more of that down and people feel more comfortable then we can do the two track and we being too complicated I just want to be respectful of um, Representative Schmick's concerns. If I may say something here, uh, mm -hmm. those are just my comments. I mean, there's a lot of people here uh, on the on the commission, and I know you're wanting to include them. I just I would have liked to have seen us to make a bit more progress, I see. and I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, with the, some of the more fundamental uh, elements. Okay. But, you know, I think your concerns are important because they do represent a segment of the population that we need to bring along in this work too, you know. Um, and we'll talk more about that, I guess. But So, are any other, oh, thank you, Jane. <laughs> Oh, oh, where'd you go? You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> I know I'm muted. I should have a nickel for every yeah. time in the past three years somebody told me I was muted. I'd be rich. Um, so one, I'm I'm trying to thread a needle here. Mm -hmm. So I agree with Aaron and with Representative Schmick around reaching, having some discussion around the principle of where we want to end up. 
And so maybe one way to approach that is for the components, right, Liz, that are identified in the report is to choose a component, have a discussion about sort of try to reach some sort of consensus about where you want to be, and then go into a discussion of, and what are the short-term or iterative steps that can get us there? Mm -hmm. So that where we're blending both the discussion about where we wanna be with a discussion about how we get there. Mm -hmm. And as Nicole said, given the fact that this is a permanent commission, how we get there, like at the end of each session, we're gonna to need to look back and say what happened this past session and how does that impact our ability to get where so, we wanna be. Right. So that's just a thought on approach. Okay, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I think actually, why don't we go to the next slide, Angela? Because <laughs> what, we, um, what we're thinking about, um, you know, in terms of breaking it apart is really spending time on each of these components in that type of a fashion. So spending a, a chunk of time on, for example, the phase one, spending a, a chunk of time on eligibility, coming up with what is the long-term goal and hearing, you know, looking at the foundation of where we're starting in our state. Um, I think Representative Schmick, you're, you're right. We need to look at that again. Things have changed over the last couple of years. There's a lot of policies that are changing in this state. We should we should look at what's what's in place, where you want to go, and then how we're going to get there. And so, um, what we are thinking about, um, and and in our conversations, we didn't, you know, we would kind of dance around the edges about eligibility and things like that, talking about the design component, but not. And then we started talking. Some folks started getting into the details, and so we're thinking based on the conversations that we've had with all of you that it makes sense to focus on eligibility as the first component who's in who's out um and that's that's what you're seeing kind of the order of of these topics here and so i do want to ask angela can we go to the next slide um you know does it make sense to, for this to be the the first component that we consider um we think you know, based on the conversations that we've had, we think it's a good starting place because it helps us be able to say once we make decisions about this program or that program or people in that or whatever, all the other topics kind of can flow from there as a starting place. And it also um, something that uh, is pretty clear in the report and we've talked about um, a lot is that starting with eligibility is uh, gives time in terms of uh, obtaining some permissions from the federal government about certain federal programs, um, which need to be decided on sooner rather than later um, because of financing. So um, question for commission members, does this make sense to you? Um, and then second question, uh, what would be the next topic after this that you'd wanna consider? Any thoughts on that? Should eligibility be the first topic to consider? Certainly, I'll say this is Dave Eisinger. I would I would think that eligibility does it's it's really foundational when I think about um, where we started in building the SEB program. Um, eligibility was one of the two main pillars of uh, what we needed to start with. So it really does feel like it's a it's a very good launching pad. And then I said two pillars were the start for kind of sub organization. So what would be the next topic? My nominee would be benefit design, which sort of gets to representative Schmidt, Schmick's point of like, who's gonna make the coverage determination aspect of it. So eligibility and then kind of core as to how benefit design will occur would be kind of my nomination for number two. And this is Joan. Hi, everybody, good evening. Um, I that we also in in thinking about the Medicaid expansion and the individual market after the ACA passed, we spent a lot of time on eligibility as well and, and building it up and how that would be determined and what that meant. So I think that's a good starting place as well. I would second that. Thank you. Anyone else have comments? And Vicki, just as a clarification, can I ask a quick question? Um, Jane, when you said you would build it into the topics, so under eligibility, would we have vision conversations about eligibility in that topic? Or instead of having a vision conversation, maybe at a separate meeting before we begin the process? Did I capture that correct? 
So what I was thinking of is we, we reach an agreement on a vision for eligibility and then we work back from that to identify the steps we would need to take to get to the vision. And hopefully, I mean, I, there's tough decisions about, do you want consensus, right? Do you want it, you know, how do we reach those agreements? And then of course, looking at what the statute says, because the statute does say healthcare coverage for all, but then it's a matter of, the how. So I think, I think, Mandy, it was the first way that you described it. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else have comments on this? Guys are so quiet. Okay. Okay. I guess. We'll I'm go back to down. taking silence as agreement. <laughs> so if you don't agree, speak up. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. And then just kind of the last piece, because again, we're, we want to get your input so that we can build out the agendas for how we're going to do this next year and bring that to you uh, in December. Um, some other topics that you might want to consider that we have heard about from all of you and that we think could be important. Uh, Angela, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, hearing about other states and what they're doing. We haven't had a chance to do a lot of that. Um, information about the current programs in Washington. Um, that whole first section of the report is about, uh, outlines a number of, of efforts that have been going on here um, and provide a lot of information about direction that uh, could be helpful to the commission. So, um, and then finally, um, a topic that we have also spent a little bit of time on, um, establishing, potentially establishing or working on some equity principles for designing the new system. Um, I think it's it's one of the um, things that we've talked about um, a lot is that, you know, equity needs to be weaved throughout all of the design. And so making sure that we have a, um, an understanding of what that means. And then finally, um, I just wanna re remind everyone that um, another thing we might wanna consider is exploring the opportunity within your current within the current authorities, because again, another unique piece about this legislation that um, set up this commission is that it spells out that subject to sufficient exist existing authority, uh, state agencies may implement specific elements of any report issued under this section. So there is some opportunity for recommendations from this commission to uh, move things forward. And I think that you know goes to the short-term solutions to some extent. But just want to put those out there for you know for your consideration and how you'd like to see those show up during um, our work next year and you know what what could be helpful to you as you start diving into eligibility and other topics and the design work. Jane? I'm talking way too much, but <laughs> the, each of these bullets, I think rather than other potential topics are actually the elements of the discussion of each issue. Okay. So th that to me, that almost reads like uh, when we're talking about eligibility, start with what do we know about current programs in Washington with some sort of nifty graphic that shows who's left out, who's not in. Joan probably already has that like <laughs> manufactured somewhere. I um, think she does. <laughs> right. Building in the equity. What what are the equity principles? What okay. what do we what have we learned from other states? And then the fourth bullet is really the iterative short term question. Short -term. Okay. So and the only other thing that that I, I keep I keep struggling with with the governance question, right? Is it do we talk about the how? Because the how is the governance question. So just something to throw out there. 
I also like including governance in the context of information from other states as well. Okay. Like including that is something that we're, we're all keen to understand a bit more. That's great. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm just taking notes. I know other people are too, but I want to keep it fresh in my mind. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? I think that's a great idea, Jane. I concur. Any specific things from other states that you'd like to hear about? I mean, I, I you know, I think Jane, you were saying we for each of the components, like what have you done around eligibility, blah, blah, blah. But are there any specific states you're that you all are thinking about or are really interested in hearing about? Nicole? Um, well, I mean, given that uh, both California and Oregon have issued reports, potentially those uh, to start. Okay. okay. I know we talked before, um, Liz, that uh, I think it was Vermont. I know we had a public comment one time about making sure we learn from failures of um, other universal healthcare systems, and I wasn't aware of any. So <laughs> I know that I think Vermont did something and they did right and and i think it's lessons learned right yeah, so, lessons yes and we know that colorado was doing a lot of innovative mm -hmm. work um that we may want to hear more about mm -hmm. it's like pitfalls to avoid or mm -hmm. you know when to do the waivers yeah <laughs> those kind of things or how the how their waivers went i think could be right okay Anyone else? Um, okay, well, we're gonna take all this and come up with a more specific work plan with potential agendas and bring it back to you. And I think this is, again, the exciting part to, to be able to dive into the details. So thank you. And I'm gonna hand it over to Gary to talk about the FTAC. Thank you, Liz, and it's great to be with all of you again. Um, I know from the conversation, everyone is very eager to begin moving forward with the work of the FTAC and getting to the, some of the more specific um, recommendations for how to move forward with the system. So we're coming to you today with two items. Uh, one is the draft charter. Um, we're not asking for a vote on the charter today, but we do uh, would like to hear uh, your thoughts on um, on the charter and and specifically what are you looking for from the FTAC? How, how can the FTAC best assist you in making the decisions about uh, the key design elements such as eligibility as we've been discussing? The, the structure that we've talked about is having meetings alternating. So the FTAC would do some work on an issue and then that issue would be brought to the commission for discussion and potential um, um, vote on a recommendation uh, based on that work. We've tried in the to be responsive to some of the comments that were made as we were talking about the FTAC at earlier meetings to make it very clear that it's the commission that is the decision-making body. The FTAC is an advisory body, not a decision-making body. And the FTAC is really working at the direction of the commission in terms of um, the, both the scope uh, of, of its work and, and what the commission is looking for from it. So um, we'd really welcome any comments that you have today uh, about how you think the FTAC can best function and whether the charter is adequately capturing um, the role of the FTAC. And then uh, obviously after the meeting, it, after you've had more time to, to think about it, we'd welcome any comments from you um, as well. Nicole? I'm sorry. Can you remind me what page the FTAC starts on? Uh, the charter? The charter is at uh, tab six, I believe. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.
there's a lot that's in there about process uh, and the, you know, the conduct of the meetings and that sort of thing. Um, but I think the, you know, the, the most substantive point that we try to make, as I said, is, you know, just making clear what the, what the relationship between the FTAC and the commission is. Any comments? It's basically, we tell them what we want them to work on and they work on it and bring it back to us. Jane? So I guess my question is, given the discussion that we just had about sort of how we structure discussions of elements, does it make sense to, I haven't even looked, right, because I haven't read what's on the piece of paper on the charter, but would it make sense to sort of integrate those elements into what the FTAC is doing? In, if that, if the commission thinks that the information in those bullets is critical to our being able to make a decision, do we want to direct the FTAC to do some of that work to pull the information together? Yes, and Mandy, I don't. I, th I think the, the 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 commission can give directions to the FTAC separate from the charter, right? I mean, it doesn't That's need. Correct. To, yeah. Okay. This is just the sort of operating backbone, and it's intended to mirror the commission's uh, charter. It looks sort of similar in terms of structure, and um, except for setting up sort of those basic principles of how um, the commission will work with, or rather, FTAC will work with the commission. So we could at the next meeting, Jane, um, when we have a the more fleshed out work plan, we could have some more specific direction for the commission to give to the FTAC to begin its work. And in the meantime, the FTAC has to be selected and, and constituted, right? Um, so that might be a way to, to incorporate um, what you're asking. I could also send out a word version. If that helps people uh, think about what they'd like the charter to say. That would be that. Yeah, Mandy, this is Dave. I think that would be a good idea. No problem. I will get that taken care of. I, for me, that's the reason I mentioned it. For me, it's I love to work in a word document myself. It helps me ponder. So. I understand. Um, okay, so uh, then, um, Angela, if you could go to slide 14, we do want to begin the process of uh, selecting members for the FTAC, and so we'll, we'll be asking for a vote to do that. Uh, HCA will be responsible for sending out a call for applications. There is a draft application in your materials. Um, one issue that we wanted to raise uh, today is that um, the, the commission um, likely will benefit from having members of the FTAC who um, are in the industry in one capacity or another because of their expertise. And because the FTAC is not a decision-making body, but only an advisory body, um, it may be appropriate to have members who otherwise would have a conflict of interest. And so one of our questions is, do you agree with that? Number one, and number two, would you um, wanna see FTAC members disclose any conflicts of interest that they do have so that at least the public and you all will know um, who they are and, and what, you know, what what their position is and how that might affect um, um, the advice that they're giving. Uh, and then more broadly, are there any other specific questions that you think applicants should be asked as part of the process of uh, putting together the membership? And 
remind me, Mandy, this is modeled off the application that the HCR already used for some other. Um, so, yeah, the application is modeled off part off the, the commissions, how the governor selects for the commission members, and also in part off the advisory committee selection process in Oregon that they utilize for the Universal Healthcare Task Force. Um, it's actually not displayed right now. So if you wanna go one slide, you can see that the, uh, the potential application is in the materials um, for you, for commission members. Um, but I also wanted to highlight one of the reasons why we were thinking about moving forward with the application process is that this, uh, we set a minimum, the commission set a minimum of 30 days to receive applications. So if the commission wanted to start FTAC at January 1st, and knowing that that first meeting is usually a training meeting, um, like the one the commission members did, so it actually wouldn't get its work underway until then March. Um, if we wanted to do that in building in that 30 days for application, it was originally set at 60, 30 to 60 days for an application, we would probably want to issue that out as soon as possible. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to get this um, in front of you today. If we want to, if the commission would like to begin FTAC, at the Jan for the January meeting. Any thoughts on that, Representative Schmick? Yeah, I had a question. When you were talking mm -hmm. about, could you describe, uh, I was thinking about the conflicts of interest. Um, can you describe what you foresee uh, as could be conflicts that, because I think that people should disclose, but what, what type of thing are you seeing? I mean, what do you what do you envision there? As an example, please. Well, anybody who is in the healthcare industry now, who works for a hospital or a health system, who works for a provider organization, certainly certainly who works for a health plan, um, you know, th those might be people who would be useful members of the FTAC because of their background and experience. But clearly, you'd want them to. The, the suggestion is you'd want them to disclose you know, their background um, so that everyone would be clear as to who they are and, and what their role is in, in, in the industry. Uh, I would, I, I would, if I could, uh, I think that we should have disclosure because these are the people that are, that are in the industry and we need that input. Thank you. Dave, Dave, then Joan. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with Representative Schmick. I think um, I'd also highlight there could be um, insurance brokers who might be interested in joining the FTAC, and there's obviously you know potential interests there that could be a, a conflict. So I think there's a wide range. Um, I'm, I'm glad, Gary, that you highlighted a variety of different aspects on the provider side, but I just want to acknowledge there's a whole um, healthcare industry that exists in our state and in our country um, that that will have uh, a view and, and would be impacted by uh, such a large transition. And those are also potential conflicts that um, and background that would be important to have highlighted. So absolutely think it's imperative to include the conflict aspect. And I was curious, is there a page two to the application? I, I guess I should scroll more in the document, but yeah, if you could leave that up for a little bit while we go on to Joan, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Joan? Yeah, I, I would echo that. I think I think it's important to ask about conflict. I think we want the expertise and I think we would want to know kind of positionally, particularly to the extent people are benefiting financially from from being in the health system and potentially from the perspective they would bring or the advice they'd be providing as a commission member. I would appreciate knowing that. I also appreciated the inclusion of some of the, you know, sort of equity questions of, to help understand the lens that people would bring and to make sure we kind of have a diversity of perspectives. So we'll defer to others on best practices there, but um, appreciate those questions were asked as well. I would, I, um, it's a, it's a robust application. So I think, I think people would, will, will need to um, be mindful and thoughtful, but I, I don't perceive the length as being a barrier to someone who would want to be on, but would also defer to others on best practices around, you know, making sure it's, it's an accessible, barrier. accessible process as well. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Adisha? So I have a kind of um, question slash concern. Um, I, my assumption is that FTAC will in kind of 
giving us advice on feasibility of various elements will have to um, give us some evidence or they have to do some data-driven work. Is that a correct assumption on my part? Yes, I think that's right. I mean, depending on the issue, but sure, yes. Okay. Um, so, you know, the presentations we have seen so far, they have provided us, you know, data and statistics and evidence. Those, um, a lot of peer-reviewed journals have been quoted. A lot of the data are easily, we can reproduce them because the data are public use. Um, the kind of questions we will have for FTAC, I believe, will be absolutely new because we are looking at just Washington state population, looking at the costs, benefits of various elements. Where will those data come from? And can we reproduce those results? Because they will not be peer reviewed. So I'm, I'm kind of, con it, well, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, six will be manufactured, but I kind of want to have an understanding of the transparency of where they're getting, um, you know, where they, how they're calculating the feasibility. I don't know, does that make sense? Well, I think that the, the commission can certainly direct the FTAC to um, disclose and make public uh, to, to you and to the public whatever data and information they're relying on um, to make their recommendations or to provide you with their op the options that they're looking at. Um, I'm not sure I can answer the question of where is that data going to come from? I mean, I think that's going to be part of the process. <laughs> And they'll have state staff support and the consultants will support them too. Mandy, Liz, Gary. <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. yeah. They're gonna be out there on their own, just like, yeah. And so that will help give them access to some state data, like I'm sure Joan, the exchange has information on coverage and and the PEB program, Dave, I'm sure there's information there that's helpful. I also just want to highlight that commission members are also welcome to serve on FTA. So, Mandy, to clarify, you mean to participate, to listen in on FTAC meetings? No, no, there's in the FTAC documents, there are two positions held if any member of the commission is interested in serving on FTAC. So um, I think that that was the vote back then. Um, it's certainly in the document still um, that if two members from the commission are interested in serving on an FTAC, there are at least two, member, two positions held. And I know that in Oregon, it, it, the members of the advisory committees are primarily the commission members. And is there, would the commission member go through the, the full application process or how would that work? I think that would be up to the commission, but I would think that you guys probably do not need to do that since you've sort of done a version of this application when you did your process. Okay. I think it could be that you could email me your interest. I think it could be simple like that for the commission's consideration. Has everybody but that's had just a time? suggestion. <laughs> Has everybody had enough time to review this page? We go. There's a third page, unfortunately. I think <laughs> there might be a fourth page. Is there? <laughs> I think there are a few more. Yeah. <laughs> and this Big is kind spaces. of where we, where we, yeah, where we kind of get that information that you were talking about, Joan. But also using the lobbyist um, information that is in the the governor's board and commission application. And nothing wrong with being the red registered lobbyist, just it's good to know. And it's okay to go on to the next page. Yeah. <laughs> Is 
And if you want to spend the time, we can also send out this application too for your review. Or if you think that the questions are too much, we can sort of currently right now, I can put it up and we can edit it online like we've done previously. Uh, what did we do it before? We did it with the charter, the draft okay. charter once before. I mean, I think who had the question about if the application, does it, is, is this too much? It might be a barrier to um, people that we would want on the FTAC. I know every time I have to fill out one of these, it takes me forever. <laughs> yeah, Vicki, I was just saying, I defer to others with more expertise in this process. Like to me, if the Office of Equity and the governor's office and you yeah. know, HCA's expertise in filling these commissions, if this is sort of consistent with best practices and asking people to serve on these types of committees, I happily defer to experts there in my in my view. Okay. Representative Schmick. Sorry to bug in bug in here no. again. If I had to fill this out, I never would. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. We really appreciate it. Um, and Dr. J is not here from the Office of Equity. Maybe we run it by her staff. I mean, under an email. Okay. Representative Schmick. Sorry, um, I'd like oh, to see okay. some uh, a very simple question, I and mean, maybe it's covered in a roundabout way. But what do you bring to the table? What do you yeah. bring to this committee? Okay. I do you believe that that is a commission, uh, a question on the application? Um, it is, I don't have that. Hold on just one second. And if I kind of got, knows... got lost then uh, <laughs> with the length of the questionnaire. Mm -hmm. If anybody pulls it up before me, let just feel free to shout is it, it the question that says please describe your relevant experience and how it would benefit FTAC yes mm -hmm. and then why are you interested in serving yeah on the FTAC um so the next step with the um Applic uh, Representative Schmick? I'm sorry. Don't apologize. Um, <laughs> um, for the commission members that would might consider to do uh, to serve on this subcommittee, any idea about the time commitment we're talking about here? Well, uh, currently, right now, it would be scheduled for bi monthly meetings similar to the commission. So um, unless we somehow get more staffing, it is currently set at alternating months with the commission. So uh, probably an equal obligation, perhaps more depending on the requests of the commission. Um, it, it is sort of how the commission structures what FTAC needs to do, but the meeting structure um, is set for bi-monthly meetings. Now, I don't know how much work that would be involved on uh, FTAC members perhaps outside of the meeting, like for example, yeah. learning and those types of things, but the meeting structure is on a cadence of bi-monthly meetings as well. I do think there would be some pre-meeting work um, involved, definitely. It would be at least double what you're doing and more. Mm. I guess this would be another way to say it. <laughs> Jones, <a> good one. <laughs> Can I ask? Um, in in Oregon and other places where they they've stood up similar types of advisory boards, just what the level of um, state agency participation typically is. I'm just wondering, given the statutory language you showed earlier about state agency authorities, I know that. I think Department of Revenue, Revenue and OFM were going to get pulled in as part of the mm -hmm. FTAC. I wasn't sure if there were any other state agencies people envisioned or that would be needed to support the work. In thinking about who to let know when this is this process has started. 
Is that a question for commission members? It, it, uh, uh, well, I was just thinking if for you all, for you and, and for Gary and others, for folks who've looked at these structures and other places, I just wasn't sure what level of state agency engagement was typical was typical um the financing divisions of, in Oregon were required to participate in um the advisory committees that is not a requirement of the legislation of this com this this commission's legislation um it is our hope that they will so that they can provide that advice to the commission um, so our, our goal is to reach out to those entities and see if they would be willing to have someone serve um, similar to as is done in other states, because certainly having that revenue feedback would be very helpful. Um, I know finances, as far as other states and the um, interrelatedness of serving on FTAC, um, it, it is finance for sure. And I don't know about other state agencies except for the Department of Health, so their version of the Healthcare Authority, Oregon oh. Health Authority. Oh, ha. yeah. Two staffs. Yeah, I mean, it just, beyond staffing, it just seems to me that the state agencies, right, OIC's got monthly enrollment data for individuals, small mm -hmm. group, large group. Dave's got detailed enrollment data on PEB and SEB and cost information. Jones got a bunch of, it just seems like it would be assumed that the agencies that are represented on the commission and or staffing the commission would try to do whatever we could do to get the data requests for that both either FTAC or the commission requests to the commission. And to me, that sort of regardless of whether any of us sit on the FTAC, it seems like that's part of the reason that the legislature chose to have us on the commission. Yeah, and I was thinking, Jane, too, about OFM and some of these other, you know, the state agencies that have the financing information that it isn't necessarily represented by current mm -hmm. commissioners. That will be critical, I think, to that group. So I agree. Um, Nicole, did you have your hand up? And then to speak. <laughs> sure, I'll go ahead. Uh, this might be opening up a box of worms, but uh, I, if I recall, looking at uh, at Oregon's task force, gosh, last year or so, uh, they they created like a way to delineate their their finance committee, if I'm correct, like they divided up into different subsections. Uh, is that something that we would be able to direct them to do at a later point or how would how would that work? Or if we're working, I guess, um, in the model of which we take topic by topic, would, would FTAC be just joining us on that topic or I don't know, maybe that's not making sense. I'm just curious. No, I, think, I think it makes sense. So would they have like subcommittees of the right, committee right. or would they all stick together and just say, let's do eligibility. And then we assign them eligibility tasks and then they give us back information. Yeah, I was just thinking because uh, certain members of FTAC might have a very specific um, expertise level. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm just wondering how we're accounting for that. On here. I mean, I think I think the FTEC, the the issue of subcommittees has come up before, and I think the limitation has really been um, a question of staffing, um, and the limitation um, on the, the ability to staff more than you know. But certainly, the FTAC, the, the commission can direct the FTAC to do its work however it thinks best, and the FTAC itself could decide to say send off two or three members to look at one particular issue and two or three members to look at another particular issue and divide the the, the workload that way and it might make sense as you suggest to to uh, do that based on the background and the expertise of the particular members so i don't think there's any limitation um as far as how the ftac could do that other than um the the resources that would be needed. Great, right, thank you.
Any other thoughts on the application? Um, so the goal here is kind of to get the application moving forward. So. So we'd like, Vicki, to turn it back to you to entertain a motion to start the process. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gary. So entertaining a motion for initiating the FTAC application for membership process. Nicole? I think the application looks good. Um, you know, adding in that transparency piece that we were talking about earlier. Um, I think it, we're ready to get it out if we're looking at a March timeline uh, to get them onboarded. Okay, thank you. So is that a motion? That is a motion. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Motion to approve. <laughs> is there a second? And again, I can't remember if I'm confusing meetings when I do that. <laughs> Vicki, I appreciate your suggestion to have Dr. J and team look at it too. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if there's a way to sort of move um, it forward with the that you know with the assumption that we get eyes on it to make sure the equity section and the and the accessibility makes sense. I think right. that would I, so I let's say that. motion to initiate the FTAC application process by running it through <laughs> the Office of Equity, and then once it's approved, then it can it can go out. I agree to the you Jones can say pending. <laughs> Sorry, you can you can probably say pending pending pending. Uh, pending thank you of uh, Dr. J. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Office of Equity uh, yes. review of the application. I agree with Jones' friendly amendment. <laughs> Right. Get ready for session with the friendly amendments. So exactly. we'll forming <laughs> exactly. up. All right. Is there any discussion? Any discussion? Okay. So all those in favor of moving forward through the Office of Equity and then out. Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. We're approved. Is that it <laughs> for the agenda? Okay. <laughs> um, so the application will be finalized based on the feedback from today. And then we'll begin the FTEC application membership process. As Mandy mentioned, 30 day minimum, and that'll get us reviewing in December. And then um, we'll be begin planning topics for upcoming meetings based on today's feedback. Is there any other discussion before? I mean, we're half an hour ahead, so I just wanna make sure that we didn't miss, because some of you were really quiet, Representative Richelli. I'm not even sure he's still here. <laughs> oh, Representative Schmick. How will this uh, form or this FTAC committee, how will this information be disseminated? You mean to the people who could apply or back to us? Oh, to the okay, to the public. Mandy? Um, yes. So we have an email listserv and we also for people who sign up for interest in the commission, and we'll also be posting it on the commission's webpage along with the application process. Um, and we will email it out to commission members as well in case you would like to circulate it in um, any of your circles um, for potential applicants. Does anybody have any other ideas? I think that that's a really good topic um, and we have some time. Does anybody have any different ways? So I'm, I'm making the assumption and I shouldn't that will the commission members will be notified that when this is going out uh, so that we also can disseminate that. Is that, is that a correct? Correct. Okay, yes. great. Mm -hmm. There you are. 
Oops, did you cut out? Is that go forward? Did we lose her? I think we lost Vicki. Oh. Oh. That was weird. Maybe she'll be back in one minute. You're waiting for me. Did I miss something? No. Okay. No, no. Uh, we lost Vicki momentarily. And, um, but I think she's we can back. She just is joining now. Great. Thank you. Hi, sorry. <clears throat> Vicki, I think you were just calling on Rep. Riccelli. Yeah, sorry, my computer just died. Yes, Representative Riccelli, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh no, no, I was just saying I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm listening along. I mean, part of my comments are, you know, I supported going forward, but it's sending a, you know, it's sending a report to myself, so <laughs> I support <laughs> that. So you know, I just didn't have much comments there, but I, you know, appreciate the work. And then the, uh, you know, I've said in previous meetings the the real work um of moving forward is on navigating a lot a lot of the financial aspects of this and the mechanics for that so i'm looking forward and i really appreciate the um kind of the organizing on the the, the key points of membership and who's in and benefits so happy happy to share that um i just i'm agreeable today thank you Anyone else? Any other thoughts before we close? Okay, that was the last call. <laughs> I just want to thank you all again for um, joining us today, for the commission members, for the members of the public who um, helped guide us. And um, our next meeting is December 15th at 3 p.m. And so the legislative report is going forward. We've got the FTEC application, good work today. And then um, we look forward to seeing you at the next meeting. So everybody have a great Halloween and enjoy your, your favorite fall things. We'll see you in December. Take care. Thanks, Becky. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody.